hours a day just so I don't lose my hope. Desperation in Ontario, anger in Alberta. Justin Trudeau's roadshow gets dramatic. Fort McMurray's Walmart under fire. If that's actually proven, then that's not good for them. It's accused of putting shoppers at risk. A teen athlete turned homeless addict. I fell in love with the needle. I, like, I, I could not stop. Why fear may be her best hope. Plus, seven days and counting to President Trump. The wary outlook from around the world. If Justin Trudeau was expecting Canadians to go easy on him during his cross-country tour, it didn't happen today. The Prime Minister faced tough questions, the toughest on energy issues, where he had to reconcile policy with the realities faced by thousands of people in this country. Katie Simpson has more on that from Ottawa tonight. Katie? Wendy, for months, people living in Ontario have been complaining about unacceptably high hydro bills. And today, their frustrations became the Prime Minister's problem. The cold wasn't enough to keep people away. Lineups exploded out of this arena in Peterborough, Ontario, as they eagerly waited for the chance to speak with the Prime Minister. I'm hoping to get a question in about basic income. I would say that, you know, look at the economics first before you institute a new carbon tax. While the crowd was cheerful and respectful, Justin Trudeau was once again challenged. My heat and hydro now cost me more than my mortgage. I now... Kathy Katula, a working grandmother with a disability, confronted the Prime Minister about her provincial hydro bills that are more than $1,000 a month. I make almost $50,000 a year, Mr. Trudeau, and I'm living in energy poverty. How is it justified for you to ask me to pay a carbon tax when I only have $65 left of my paycheck every two weeks to feed my family? Trudeau was quick to point out that hydro is a provincial responsibility and stood by his national carbon pricing plan. In this time of transition, we do not penalize people who are already uh, stretched uh, to and in some cases uh, beyond the breaking limit in terms of their finances. And that's what we're leaving it in the hands of the provinces to do. The Prime Minister fielded a wide range of questions during other stops on the second day of his listening tour, including a visit to a rural Ontario diner and during a breakfast with military families at CFB Trenton. But one issue that isn't dominating the tour Trudeau's controversial vacation to the Aga Khan's island and whether he broke the Conflict of Interest Act by accepting a private helicopter ride. Despite persistent criticism from the opposition and questions from the media, Trudeau says Canadians have other concerns. The issues they're talking about are issues uh, that, uh, uh, that affect uh, uh, themselves, their kids, our environment, our economy. Not so for Bill Denby. I believe he should take his holidays in Canada and he should support the Canadian public. While Trudeau isn't shying away from the tougher questions, he isn't necessarily giving direct answers. And as his tour continues to cross the country, that could eventually frustrate some of his audiences. Wendy. Thanks so much, Katie. Katie Simpson in Ottawa. The other comment dogging Trudeau today also had to do with energy. He's been clear at some point Canada has to move past fossil fuels. But what he said today drew some anger. Carolyn Dunn explains. For years, it has been an engine powering the Canadian economy, but at the same time winning a dubious global reputation in some circles as dirty oil. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has been trying to balance his oil sands position between the environment and the economy. Today, a message that seemed off balance. You can't make a choice between what's good for the environment and what's good for the economy. Uh, we can't shut down the oil sands tomorrow. Uh, we need to phase them out. Cue the outrage. Wild Rose Party leader Brian Jean tweeted at Trudeau, if you want to phase out the oil sands, you'll have to go through me and four million Albertans first. And provincial PC leadership candidate Jason Kenney says Trudeau's comments indicate he doesn't champion Alberta's energy industry. 
if we phase out the Canadian production of oil, what we do is phase in more foreign oil sources, many of which are, are not very good places. Any hint that Trudeau's government is even considering phasing out the oil sands is political dynamite. Alberta Premier Rachel Notley quickly posted reassurances on social media. Alberta's oil and gas industry and the people who work in it are the best in the world. And we're not going anywhere anytime soon. And in an interview on CBC Radio's The House. I think that we need to not get too excited about that particular comment. And we have to remember this is coming from a prime minister who just approved not one but two pipelines. Environmentalist Ed Whittingham says the controversy is much ado about nothing except politics. People are seizing upon this comment, uh, trying to extract a meaning that isn't there and using it for political purposes. A Trudeau spokesperson insists his position hasn't changed, that his comments are just reiterating the need to move away from fossil fuels. And in an effort to blunt political reaction, he noted former Prime Minister Stephen Harper had also supported the move away from a carbon economy, of course, setting the year 2100 as the target. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. After the town hall, Trudeau headed to Toronto to the Raptors training ground. That's where he met these students from Laloche, Saskatchewan. Almost a year ago, the community was rocked by a deadly school shooting. That tore open old issues from housing to mental health support. Raptors GM Masai Ujiri, who has helped many young people through sport, helped arrange the trip. Just one week to go now. Next Friday, Donald Trump will take the oath of office in Washington. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe went outside to check the mood. Lindsay? Wendy, this city is getting ready to welcome the new president, but the atmosphere here is more uncertain than excited. The historic rituals, so familiar and yet somehow so different this time. It's more somber, it's not as exciting. I'm not for me personally, I'm just saying that I get that sense. Even some Donald Trump supporters aren't completely enthusiastic. With President like Trump coming in, it's just been so controversial that I think it's a bit tainted, but uh, I guess for his supporters, we're all excited. We are so immensely divided by what's about to take place that I think our country's not in a good place. The president-elect himself is still dwelling on the election, tweeting this morning about Hillary Clinton's emails and the FBI, calling her guilty as hell, saying she campaigned in the wrong states, no enthusiasm. Little wonder many worry the tone of the campaign will spill over into the business of government. If you would raise your right hand. And that's why so much is being made of this week's cabinet confirmation hearings. One after another, nominees presented policy positions and worldviews different from the rhetoric of the president-elect. The potential secretary of state sounds tough on Russia. Russia must be held to account for its actions. The soon-to-be CIA director doesn't support waterboarding, no matter what his would-be boss said on the campaign trail. Would I approve waterboarding? You bet your ass I'd approve it. Another contrast? The probable defense secretary believes in upholding the deal to limit Iran's nuclear development. When America gives her word, we have to live up to it and work with our allies. Senators wary of Trump seem to like the answers. And Donald Trump seems to be welcoming dissent. I told him, be yourselves and say what you want to say. Don't worry about me. And I'm going to do the right thing, whatever it is. I may be right, and they may be right. But I said, be yourselves. What do you say, Steve? Let them... And yes, Wendy, Donald Trump did make those comments, standing next to game show host Steve Harvey. Survey says, in just one week, it's going to be a lot different around here. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Lindsay Duncombe. Now to the other big story in Washington, those allegations that Russian officials have compromising information about Donald Trump, including details described as salacious. It started a fiery debate. Journalist Matt Taibbi brings a rare perspective, having covered politics in Washington and Moscow. The big news this past week has been the unverified report about alleging that he was blackmailed, that he was compromised, that he was spied on by the Russians. You lived and worked in Russia for a long time. What, what's your take on all of that? Is well, he first, a, a puppet of Putin? Well, it's, it's very hard to say. You know, I lived in Russia for a long time. I personally remember 
uh, Putin destroying uh, government officials with sex tapes. Uh, I was there, I remember watching him uh, when he was the FSB chief uh, give an analysis of a sex tape involving uh, a character named Yuri Skaratov. Uh, they've done this over and over again in their past. Uh, there was a justice minister, there was the former prime minister, Mikhail Kasayanov. Um, so this is something they do. It but the Russians were saying yesterday they would never do anything like that. They would never. Well, no, that's ridiculous. They've done it demonstrably in, in their past. Uh, and it doesn't defy belief at all that they would do it with, with foreign businessmen. In fact, I, I would think that they would do that more with foreign businessmen than they would with their own. Um, however, there's really no concrete evidence still that Trump uh, is involved in any of the shenanigans that have been alleged. Matt Taibbi had much more to say about Donald Trump and his presidency. You can watch the full interview this Sunday on The National. The U.S. Department of Justice has laid out a scathing report about Chicago's police force. The Chicago Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of use of excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Black and Latino civilians are hardest hit by that pattern of force. The DOJ started investigating after the death of teenager Laquan McDonald, seen here. He was shot 16 times by a white police officer. Police in Florida appear to have cracked an 18-year-old case. This young woman was abducted as a newborn, uh, and she was going to need time, to, time and assistance uh, to process all of this. The woman, who was taken from hospital as a newborn, has been found living in South Carolina. The person who raised her has been charged with kidnapping. Police escorted a former Ontario nurse back to court today. Elizabeth Wetlaufer is already facing eight murder charges in the deaths of nursing home patients. But as John Lancaster explains, the allegations now run even deeper. Cuffed, shackled, leg irons clanking, the former nurse's case took another dark turn today. More allegations. Specifically, Elizabeth Wetlaufer injected elderly patients with potentially deadly doses of insulin. And for the first time, the families and friends of those harmed had the chance to set eyes on her. Rage and anger. Like, oh, and I never felt anything like that in my life. Now she stands before us, and we want her to see how hurt and how much pain we have for our loved ones. Inside the court, six new charges against Wetlaufer involving six more seniors. Four counts of attempted murder and two of aggravated assault. She's already accused of killing eight people. It was all too much for some. I'm just picturing my father as her patient and what he went through and how he couldn't talk and how he couldn't say help and how nobody cared and how he lied in that bed and had to die with nobody there. And it may not end here. It's a very uh, intense investigation, and obviously there's still a lot more questions than answers, uh, but it's an ongoing investigation, um, and it's one that uh, all the services are jointly looking at, looking at and working together. One of the newly identified patients, 77-year-old Sandy Towler, a widow who was allegedly poisoned at this Paris, Ontario facility. CBC News has learned Towler's nurse was away, and Wetlaufer was called in to care for her. Instead, Towler almost died of a suspected insulin overdose. The latest allegations involve patients at one private home and three southwestern Ontario care facilities Wetlaufer worked at. What type of inspections were taking place internally in the nursing home? They have a duty. If you're taking somebody under your care, you have a duty to make sure they're properly being taken care of. Already, the Ontario government has identified problems at the Paris facility, including unattended drug carts left out in public places. So far, police have identified 14 alleged victims. But CBC News has learned police recently began looking into two more deaths in London, Ontario. So far, investigators haven't revealed any motives in these cases, Wendy, but they have not alleged Elizabeth Wetlaufer was working as some sort of angel of mercy. Thanks so much, John. John Lancaster in Toronto. Coming up... What's happening here is just amazing. Unlikely allies cast aside their religious divide. Plus, why are former hotspots dying out? I think there's a generation or two out there for sure that I would be surprised if they've ever seen live music. 
Auto parts maker Takata has agreed to plead guilty in the U.S. and pay $1 billion for knowingly selling defective airbag inflators. Takata ignored that data and submitted false reports that concealed the truth about the condition of the inflators, and that created certainly great risk to the public. Three Takata executives are criminally charged. Exploding airbags are linked to 16 deaths worldwide. Walmart is facing more than 170 charges in Alberta. It's for selling food that was either contaminated or unfit for human consumption after the Fort McMurray wildfires last year. Briar Stewart explains. Even those buildings left unscathed by the flames in Fort McMurray were affected by the smoke. Any business that sold food was told what to keep and what to toss. Anything soft is being tossed out. All food is being tossed out. But health officials say not everyone followed their directions, so they've laid 174 charges under the Public Health Act against this Walmart store in downtown Fort McMurray and four senior managers with the company. In a statement, Alberta Health Services says, it is our belief that Walmart reopened, selling wildfire contaminated food to the public. This was a direct and avoidable risk to the health of this community. And it certainly didn't sit well with some shoppers who learned of the news late today. If it's proven to be true, then definitely there should be some, some penalty against it. Or the consumers would definitely need to know. The majority of the charges are related to selling food that was contaminated or unfit for consumption. The products range from cheese slices to deli meats to yogurt drinks and even baby formula. Walmart is accused of telling public health inspectors the store wasn't selling contaminated food. Well, I think the most alarming thing is the, le the literal number of uh, violations here. This food scientist says health officials are likely being overly cautious, but there is a real risk of contamination if heavy smoke wafted into the store. Toxic soot and ash could leave a residue on packaging. The worst thing that can happen is that if you've got exposed food, some of these chemicals can actually absorb onto the food and therefore contaminate it. So when we ingest it, we get intoxication. As for Walmart Canada, it says it's surprised by the charges. In a statement, the company says it worked closely with food inspectors and with the city's crisis management team to reopen the store after the fire. The case is now before the courts. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. Health officials in B.C. are warning people to avoid eating raw oysters following an outbreak of the norovirus. In the last month, more than 70 people across the province have become ill. All had eaten raw or undercooked oysters at home or in restaurants. The source of the outbreak is under investigation. There's no doubting it now. We are in the dead of winter and the prairies can't seem to catch a break. Saskatchewan and Manitoba are shivering under extreme cold. Our Cameron McIntosh bundled up and got outside to share the struggle. You can just see it as sunlight reflects off ice crystals in the sky. Wind whips snow back up into a freezing gust that bites and burns. For Winnipeg, day two of an extreme cold warning. A meteorologist's way of saying, stay inside. Yet Harry and Elise Lehman are toughing it out. Because we enjoy going for a walk and don't matter what kind of weather we go. It's actually not the temperature that's extreme. For this time of year, minus 25 is about average. It's the wind chill. On exposed skin, it feels more like minus 40. It's just been that kind of week. After arriving late, winter has hit here in full force. An early morning blizzard yesterday whacked southern Manitoba, messing with traffic, causing delays and closures, and concern for people without a place to go. So the message the Salvation Army wants to get out is, we have space. We've got space in our shelter. If, you, if you're on the streets, don't stay there. Come and get into our shelter. It's the reality of the dead of winter. Cold comes, you deal with it. Last month, Winnipeg had record snow. Brian Patterson was happy to have his new snowblower. Cost me $2,300. <laughs> it was brand new. Brand new. Once again, snowblowers are a popular item for Winnipeg thieves. Didn't take long for Patterson's to disappear. We got a fair bit of use out of it already this year, but would have liked another 10, 15 years worth. If it's any consolation, the forecast is snow-free for the week ahead. By next weekend, Winnipeg is expected to be in plus temperatures. 
thought warmer than a freshly jumped car battery. But the Lehmans have other plans. Yeah. yeah we're leaving next week. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> Punta Cana. That certainly makes sticking it out in this just a little easier. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. As far as bad winters go, there's one that lives in infamy in Toronto. Yes, this is Canada, and yes, it's winter, but in Toronto, this really is unusual. We haven't seen this kind of snow in well over a decade. And this city <laughs> That's Adrian Arsenault reporting 18 years ago today, the same day the mayor called in the army to help dig out the city. Toronto was brought to a standstill by three storms that brought a meter of snow in a two-week period. One way to escape the cold is to watch some live music. There's certainly no shortage of Canadian talent wanting to play, but as the CBC's Otel Halim reports, across the country, some renowned venues are struggling to keep the doors open. I think that piano has been here since we first sold this room out in September 2005, and it hasn't moved. Toronto band USS has a strong connection to small live music venues like this one. They played shows in 10 countries, but Toronto's Cameron House was the very first show they ever sold out. The dream was get downtown Toronto, pound the pavement on Queen Street, play the little venues. But many of those little venues across the country are having a tough time staying afloat. Toronto's Hughes Room closed its doors this week, though it says it's hoping to reopen. Vancouver's Railway Club closed last year. Clubs are struggling right across the country. We can't afford to operate anymore. In Halifax, the Carlton is on the verge of closing. University age kids don't go to shows. I think there's a generation or two out there for sure that I would be surprised if they've ever seen live music. Social media has changed the landscape too. The different ways that you consume music and how we all meet now um, with you know Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify. A worrying trend for music lovers. So many people are discovering new music on their phones instead of a local bar like this one. The Hoxton is also closing at the end of the month. They might be not willing to part with five or ten dollars and going to see a couple of bands that they don't really know, having a couple of overpriced beers at a place that you know they need to still get back to and using taxis or using Uber or something. It gets to be really expensive. Another issue. These small clubs are sitting on some valuable real estate. Somebody offers you a couple of million dollars to put up condos, you're going to think real, real easy on making that transition. The Cameron House says it's okay for now. It's important that these incubators are here. Yeah. <laughs> the fear is without these spaces, many artists may not get the chance to grow. Adil Halim, CBC News, Toronto. One of Canada's true hockey greats says she's hanging them up. 38-year-old Haley Wickenheiser is retiring and moving on to her next challenge, medical school. Wickenheiser, who tweeted out the announcement, joined the national team at age 15. She helped Canada to win four Olympic golds and seven world championships. Many consider her the greatest player the women's game has seen. Lord Snowden, who was once married to the late Princess Margaret, has died. He was born Anthony Armstrong Jones and married Margaret in 1960. In 1978, their divorce was a first for the royal family in centuries. But the two remained on good terms. Snowden was even one of the Queen's favourite photographers, snapping many of the family's portraits. Straight ahead, Donald Trump's new world order. We nail down concerns in six foreign cities.
One week from today, Donald Trump takes the helm of the world's most powerful country. He has already signaled that under his presidency, the U.S. will throw its weight around in ways that could rock adversaries and allies. Tonight, a global perspective. Our correspondents bring you the view from six cities where they're bracing for radical change. I'm Susan Ormiston. For Russia, Donald Trump was simply the better alternative. U.S.-Russian relations had cratered to a new low under the Obama administration, and it was seen that Hillary Clinton would just continue on that same course. So, Donald Trump, well, why not? Besides, he'd been so flattering of Vladimir Putin, how smart he was, how popular, how effectively he controlled this country. Donald Trump said he was willing to work with Russia to find solutions to some of the world's biggest problems. On Russia's list, well, a solution to Syria, with Putin in a central role, pushing back against NATO's expansion on Russia's borders and lifting those vexing American sanctions against Russia. Overall, lightening up the demonizing discourse in Washington. But after some of Trump's key nominees sounding the alarm again this week about Russia as a threat, it's hard to know what the Kremlin will be able to exact out of a Trump presidency after all. Donald Trump said this week he might not get along with Vladimir Putin, but he boasted that Russia, under his leadership, will respect the U.S. more than under any other government. That's a tall order, not necessarily seen as a gesture of friendship here. Sasha Petrosik. Chinese officials have always expected a tough line on trade from Donald Trump, but Taiwan, that was a surprise. They were shocked when Trump showed such strong support for the self governing island that China considers its territory, a part of what Beijing calls One China and a foundation of U.S. Chinese relations. For decades, Washington has respected that walking a fine line between helping Taiwan with trade and defense, while at the same time recognizing the government here in Beijing as the only real representative of China. Well, Trump says he doesn't feel bound by any of that. In fact, he says he may even move closer to Taiwan if China doesn't renegotiate some trade deals to make them more beneficial to the U.S. Now, that may simply be a negotiating tactic, but for Beijing, one China is non-negotiable. Even questioning it upsets all kinds of delicate balances, diplomatic, economic, even military, between Beijing and Washington. And from China's perspective, this is nothing short of Trump's brinksmanship. I'm Nala Ayed. Well, German Chancellor Angela Merkel said it best in a warning to EU members on Thursday. She said there was no eternal guarantee of close cooperation across the Atlantic. Now, that is a fairly pragmatic assessment of what has been a source of anxiety ever since Donald Trump was elected. Anxiety over two main pillars that have defined the relationship between the EU and the US in recent history. One is the importance of NATO, and the other is the relatively like-minded policy towards Russia. Now, in his comments before and after the election, Donald Trump has cast doubt on both. Now, Trump has made no secret of his admiration for Russian President Vladimir Putin or of his skepticism about NATO. In fact, he said he wants to improve relations with Russia, which has been under sanctions imposed both by the US and the EU because of its actions in Ukraine. Now, meanwhile, NATO has been stepping up its anti-Russia rhetoric, and NATO soldiers, including hundreds of Canadians, will soon be deployed closer to the Russian border than Moscow would like. Still, experts believe that, with advice, Trump is unlikely to undo decades of stable, predictable U.S. foreign policy. But in the corridors of power in Europe, there is definitely discomfort with what is likely Trump's defining trait, and that is unpredictability.
I'm Neil Köksal. It's complicated and it's about to get a lot more complicated in the relationship between the U.S. and Turkey in 2017. After Trump's win, the Turkish government said it welcomed his administration, likely because they think it's going to be easier to work with than a Clinton government might have been. There are also really similar populist leadership styles between Turkey's President Erdogan and Donald Trump, the same kind of lashing out tough talk and rhetoric when people speak out against them. There are also business ties. A large Turkish corporation paid millions to Trump to use the Trump name on two office towers here in Istanbul. So it sounds like a good relationship, right? But there are a number of issues that these two countries could clash on right out of the gate. Now, right after the election, Turkey brushed aside the comments that Donald Trump made during the campaign about Muslims. President Erdogan said it was just politics, not important. But it's going to be a lot harder for Turkey's government to brush aside the comments of the Secretary of State nominee Trump has put forward. Rex Tillerson, in his confirmation hearing, said yes, it wants to keep working with Turkey in Syria, but it also said that the Kurdish fighters, the YPG, should keep fighting ISIS there. The YPG, according to Turkey, is a terror organization and wants it taken out of the equation entirely. I'm Derek Stoffel. Could this stately residence behind me soon have a new occupant? If Donald Trump follows through on a campaign promise, the American ambassador to Israel could live here in Jerusalem. Trump has said that he will move the American embassy from Tel Aviv here to the holy city. It's a contentious proposal for sure, as it would recognize Israel's exclusive claim to Jerusalem. Right now, most nations, including Canada, keep their diplomatic missions about an hour down the road in Tel Aviv until the final status of Jerusalem is settled. But Trump wants to show that he's a strong supporter of Israel, and he's upset the Palestinians in doing so. They've called for a weekend of protests right across the Muslim world to try to convince Trump to reconsider the move. At the same time, Trump's choice for ambassador is also controversial. David Friedman opposes the two-state solution that many here say is the only way to find peace. While welcomed by many Israelis, Friedman has been denounced by the Palestinians who are worried about what a Trump presidency might mean for their efforts to establish their own state with its capital here in Jerusalem. I'm Margaret Evans. No man is an island, or so the English poet John Donne wrote. But last year, a majority of Brits decided, albeit by a narrow majority, that they very much like being an island unto themselves, and they decided to leave the European Union after a partnership of more than four decades. And it's very difficult for many people here to decouple the results of that referendum from the election of Donald Trump. That's partly because people on both sides of the Brexit debate view the results of those two votes as the simple of a similar malaise. Some people seeing it as a liberating cure, the results. Some people seeing them as the death knell for their liberal values. And on top of that, it piles on the uncertainty here in Britain as the country tries to figure out what its place will be in the world after it does leave the European Union. The outgoing U.S. President Barack Obama warned Brits that if they wanted to negotiate a trade deal with the United States and they left the EU, they'd have to go to the back of the line. The incoming administration says not so. We'll invite you back to the front of the line. But many people here fear that Donald Trump will be erratic and unpredictable. Can they trust on, on that kind of a pledge? The bottom line is that the election of Donald Trump reminds Brits of their own internal divisions and of the fact that they are now very much adrift, headed in unknown directions, maybe even towards a world leader who sees himself as an island with not very much time for old friends. Up next, a Nova Scotia court thinks outside the box. We develop relationships with them. Can a new approach to addiction help a former cheerleader who hit bottom? Plus, good neighbors do a good deed. They happen to be a mosque and a synagogue. But first, the day's business numbers. The TSX gained 79 points. The dollar was more or less unchanged. 
In New York, the Dow slipped slightly, the Nasdaq closed at a record high, and the price of oil was down 64 cents a barrel. We've been witnessing for months the damage of fentanyl and other opioids in so many Canadians' lives. In Nova Scotia, one court is trying to keep addicts out of prison while helping them get clean. The CBC's Elizabeth Chu got inside access to that special courtroom. Yeah, and I mean, your face is healthy, your hair looks healthy, you just look wonderful. Yeah, I feel a lot better, so that's... It's good, good to come into the new year. <laughs> 
a supportive chat between a judge and an offender. If this sounds like an unusual courtroom conversation, I want to kind of help people. It's Nova Scotia's court monitored drug treatment program, and it's believed to be Canada's only court that's just for opioid addicts. You made some really good decisions. Yeah, yeah. And like what happened last time taught me the lesson, right? They take things a lot more serious. 26-year-old Danielle McPherson pleaded guilty for assault with a weapon, but she may be spared prison if she stays clean and follows the treatment and counselling program. I'm grateful it's a second chance, so it's what I needed. <laughs> Her addiction story starts as a teenager in Cape Breton, a bubbly cheerleader, a competitive athlete. A sports injury led to abuse of painkillers, hydromorphone and Percocet. She went from ingesting opioids to injecting them. She also abused cocaine, heroin and fentanyl, an eight-year addiction. I was hard and I, I just do not stop. Eight overdoses, six suicide attempts, detox and homelessness. She also has bipolar disorder. Nothing scared her into sobriety like the possibility of prison. To be locked away like with my own thoughts, I, I think that would be the most dangerous place for me to go. This court program can take participants up to two years to complete. That's Chief that's Judge that's Pam that's Williams that's guides that's the progress from the bench. We develop relationships with them, and so when they stumble or they relapse, which often happens, um, we all feel the effects of it. Since it started in 2014, 16 people have been accepted into the program, and so far, six have been kicked out. One person has quit. Two have made it to graduation. McPherson's 11 months into the program, the longest she's been clean. She's now trusted to take home the drug Suboxone in a locked case. The medication curbs her opioid withdrawal symptoms. What do you think your chances are, Danielle? To, to graduate? I think, I think I'll graduate for sure. Keep up the good work. All right, thanks, Ron. McPherson hopes to be one of the next to graduate. That was awesome. You did fantastic. Elizabeth Chu, CBC News, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Straight ahead, Muslims and Jews join forces in an act of charity. You'll see who they're helping right after the break.
members of a Syrian family torn apart by war are together again, building a new future in Canada. It's a reunion they weren't sure they would ever have, and it's thanks to an unusual partnership between members of different faiths. Haver Gould has an inspiring story of generosity and cooperation. She hasn't seen her family in three years. Now their flight to Canada is eight hours late. Rasha Elandari is an archaeologist, studying the shifts in ancient populations by analyzing pieces of shattered pottery, learning from what is left behind. I look at what people made uh, 6,000 years ago and uh, how uh, they were moving, why they moved uh, because of a warfare or because they wanted to change the place. This is uh, their son. I haven't met him yet. So you haven't met this guy? No. I, I don't know him yet, you know, I just talked to him, so. But that face. There is no doubt why her parents, sisters, brothers-in-law and their kids are moving. The family fled Syria in fear. People in my country or in the Middle East are fighting each other, killing each other based on their religions, you know, and the dictators are enforcing that. But here it's the opposite. That's for sure. Andrew Hazen's synagogue and Ali Reza Taravian's mosque are next door to each other, have been for decades. Now they have come together, working together, to bring Rasha's family, all eight of them, to Canada. It started about a year ago. There was a phone call, and then a couple of people from the synagogue dropped by the mosque to follow up, to see if anyone thought it would be a good idea. Many did, although some hesitated. We had a very good relationship with the uh, uh, synagogue, but the only thing that we shared with them was uh, our parking lot. Some people were thinking, okay, we haven't done uh, any project with uh, uh, the synagogue. This is a big project, uh, so uh, maybe it's better to, to start a smaller one and then start a big one. So it was little but a little bit risky. Who's going to go and pick up uh, the furniture? But a lot easier than you might think. Why don't we all go get the other furniture? Yeah, and the ladies and maybe a couple of people doing the... Okay. You guys can work out this. It's okay, and if I get really cold, I'll go yeah, over to the over mosque. Mosque. Yeah. They don't talk about politics. Instead, focusing on the tasks at hand. Very yeah. nice, it's really new. Sure. Unload this and then go get the sofa. Yeah. That means working at a pace yeah. that would make most grumble. Hauling load after load in frigid weather. Actually, you know what happened in the car? My phone turned off because of the cold. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I lost you. I also, I lost you. They work together, raising money, looking for housing, and rounding up donated furniture on a cold Canadian weekend. I got an offer of another um, kitchen table and chairs. Oh, really? Should, should we? Uh, do we have room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're actually filling this thing up now. Which involves figuring out how much generosity can fit into their rented van. Allie, do you have time to do one more run with the van? Yeah, sure, yes. Because I got a, a call from a guy. We got a, a kid's uh, yes. bed and mm -hmm. desk set. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah. What else other than welcome to Canada? Can you think of anything? It has been, so far, an enormous amount of work and sometimes even fun. But both communities are trying to make a statement. That's one of the things that excited us about doing it this way. Um, is we wanted to do it in a way that showed that Canada was a place where something like this could happen. And a mosque and a synagogue could be on the same page and work together uh, on a project like this. Rasha, shopping for warm boots for her nephews, can't stop being astonished. In light of what's happening everywhere now and in the States and all that, uh, what's happening here is just amazing. It's, uh, it's you know, incredible how, the, how Canadians are collaborating with each other. Like, it doesn't matter what your religion is. He wants, he wants me to buy him a big cow. cow. Even at yeah. five in the morning, the man from the mosque and the man from the synagogue stand with Rasha at the airport, waiting. 
That's the nephew Rasha has been waiting to meet. It's a rush of emotion as the family finally reunites. <laughs> At the key moment, Andrew and Ali Reza mostly stand aside and let the joy and relief flow. Watching with what looks like typical quiet Canadian pride. You're pretty humble in this moment, the both of you. It's about them. Yes, yeah. Uh, it was one team, a uh, member of two communities, working for, to bring these uh, people here. <laughs> there are introductions. <laughs> a pause to preserve the moment. And then they are invited to join the triumphant arrival photo. And then they are off. There will be more work to come, a lot of it, but it's all teamwork. Everybody, all in. Can we have everybody? Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Havard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Just lovely. Just ahead, the daughters of a former U.S. president have advice for the Obama girls.
the world needs more Canada's. What you've achieved here in your country, this nation of nations, is, is, is really progressive and really brilliant. It's just over two weeks until Lunar New Year and the Year of the Rooster. But in China, it already looks a little like the Year of the Donald. See a resemblance with a certain president-elect? Many Chinese do. These giant inflatable roosters are now such a hit, the factory can hardly keep up with the demand. The company making the balloon says the resemblance is purely coincidental. As Barack Obama's daughters prepare to leave the White House, they got some advice from two former first daughters, Barbara and Jenna Bush. In a letter, the Bush twins wrote, Never forget the wonderful people who work at the White House and urge the Obamas to cherish your own Nancy, referring to the White House florist they shared many memories with. But recognizing they're still young, the Bush sisters also said, Explore your passions. Learn who you are. Make mistakes. You're allowed to. And that's The National for this Friday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.